as we looked at on, on Sunday, uh, Jesus is, is with his men in the upper room, and uh, he's being betrayed. Uh, Judas has left. Judas is, is with, the, um, with the leadership, and he's betraying the Lord, and he's setting up the, the situation where um, they're going to be able to find him later on in the Garden of Gethsemane. And now we, we looked at chapter 14 a couple of weeks ago as Jesus promises his, his friends, the apostles, he promises them great hope in heaven and gives them instruction about um, looking forward to the coming of the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the counselor. Uh, the Greek word is the paraclete. And uh, so now as they leave the upper room, Jesus said, arise, let's leave. And they, they, they leave the upper room and they walk through the temple precincts. The temple area is like 33 or 35 acres, enormous area. And uh, as we looked at on Sunday, the imagery that God used of Israel being his vine or his vineyard was over all of the gates, solid gold clusters as large as a man, according to Josephus. Um, clusters of, of grapes off, off of this vine. And, and Jesus now walking through with the guys, and he says this. We're just going to read from verse 1, and then we'll pick up in detail in verse 9. Jesus says, I am the true vine. In other words, as distinct from this imagery that God uses of Israel. I am the, I'm the vine, the true one, the one you need to understand, right? Uh, I'm the true vine, and my father is the gardener, the, the vine dresser, the husbandman. He's the one who prunes. He's the one who cares for the garden. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away or he, he draws up, he lifts up. And, and every branch that does bear fruit, he, he prunes or purges or washes. And you can find all the detail of this in um, the study from Sunday. In order that that branch may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears fruit much fruit. Do you see the, 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 the movement here? He goes from verse 2 talking about no fruit to fruit and then speaking of more fruit and now of course he speaks of much fruit. And that's God's desire, that's God's design for you and for me is that we bear much fruit. That becomes a very important uh, concept for you and I to understand as we walk through this. For apart from me, he says at the end of verse 5, this is a critical idea. Apart from me, if you're not abiding in Jesus, you can do nothing. Or you can do lots of things, but you can't do anything of any eternal value. And therefore, don't be expecting rewards if you're not abiding in the vine. Because it's by abiding in the vine, Jesus, that he enables us to do the things he really desires us to do, for which we will receive reward at the judgment seat of Christ one day soon. If anyone does not abide in me, verse 6, he's cast out uh, as a branch and is withered. And men gathered those, and they, and they throw them into the fire, and they're burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you may ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so be my disciples. That's God's intention for us, is that we would bear fruit, more fruit, much fruit. That's his, that's his design. In fact, if you look, we'll look at it in more detail in a moment, but verse 16, he says, You didn't choose me, but... And he says this emphatically, I, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And I appointed you, or I ordained you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain. 
See, that's our mission in life. You want to know, what's my purpose? God left me here. What's my purpose? Here it is, that you bear fruit. Not just fruit, but much fruit. That's his intention for us. Okay, so now let's start to work through these verses. Beginning in verse 9, then, Jesus says, As the Father, and, th and he just dives right in to some really, really powerful stuff. I mean, just look at your Bible. If you have a red letter Bible, you are looking at a sea of red ink right now. There are a lot of words that Jesus spoke here that John has recorded for us. Now, Matthew didn't, Mark didn't, Luke didn't. They all, they all wrote about the same time period. I mean, they, they wrote about the, um, you know, the night while he's being betrayed and all that, but they didn't get these details down. John has done that. John writing at at minimum, the age 75, maybe 80. He's writing all this down. I mean, I, that's just amazing to me. Maybe he did take notes uh, when he was younger and he was there with Jesus. But here he is recalling this, that God's bringing this to his memory. And, and he's writing this down. I mean, I can hardly remember what I did yesterday. And here's John, decades after all of this happened, many decades. Here he is writing this. And, and he knocks it out of the park. With verse 9, Jesus says, As the Father has loved me. Have you ever thought about what is that? Because if you if you sort of do the math as you're reading this, and maybe that's not those aren't the best words, do the math when we're talking about words, but how did the Father love Jesus? Well, everlasting love. Uh, there's such intimacy between the Father and the Son. Well, in the same way, Jesus says, as the Father has loved me. He says, so I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Live in my love. Grow in my love. Right? That's the idea. Abide in my love. The idea is continue in it. Trust me. I think that's where many of us really miss out, or we blow it, you might say. We don't trust that what he's promised he's really going to bring to pass. Oh, we know, I think most of us as Christians, we know the right answer. We know we're supposed to trust him. But in reality, we don't first place our trust in him on a continuing basis. So, uh, you know, we've trusted Jesus for our salvation. But in terms of how we're going to live on a day-to-day -day basis, he says, continue abiding, continue trusting in me. Now, if you keep my commandments, he says, you will abide in my love, just as I, has kept, I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. Now, don't make the mistake here of thinking that he's saying that we somehow earn his love by keeping his commandments. That's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying here, really, I, I think the, the way you would see this is we... The evidence that we love him is that we keep his commands. That's really what he's saying. If you keep my commandments, then it's evident that you're uh, abiding in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments. And you can tell that in my life, is what Jesus is saying. And I abide in my Father's love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. You really kind of just think about that for a moment. What is his goal? Well, his goal for us is that we abide in order to bear fruit. But in doing that, he's saying that as we abide in him, his joy is full and it's alive in us. And as a result, then, our joy is full. Some of us maybe have experienced that. What many of us miss out on is the truth. That that's God's desire for us on a regular basis. That we would be abiding in his love and experiencing his joy. Not happiness. Happiness is based on what happens. We're happy when, when things happen 
our way. We're not happy when things don't happen our way. Joy is entirely different. And it's not to be confused with happiness. They're different emotions. Joy is, a, is an atmosphere. It's a sense that grows up inside of us. It's a spiritually, or I should say, a supernaturally natural um, experience that we have as we abide in him, as we abide in his love. This is my commandment. Here we go. What's his commandment? My commandment is this, that you love one another as I have loved you. How is that? That we love one another sacrificially. How did Jesus love us? He, he loved us sacrificially. He gave his life. That's the evidence of, of his love for us. You know, only a, only a few days earlier, uh, Jesus was asked by one of the, the scribes, or the lawyers, rather, um, you know, what's the greatest commandment, Jesus was asked. And he said, the greatest commandment is this, that you, and he quoted the, the great Shema of Israel, Hear, O Israel. Shema means, listen up, Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then Jesus threw in a bonus. And he says, and the second commandment is like it, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. He said, from these two hang all the law and the prophets. Wow. It's important that we, that we understand this. This is nothing new. In other words, what, what, what Jesus is saying to them at this point in speaking of you know, loving one another, and this is my commandment that you love one another, this is not new. Jesus is the expression of what it means to be a, a, a godly a godly man. And, and he, he lived out the commands of his father. So here he is saying, my commandment is that you love one another just as I have loved you. Now you can't do it. Well, why bother saying it then, John? Well, you can do it, but you can't do it. You're confusing me. I understand. But we're commanded to do it, but you can't do it. So how do you do it? You can only do it as you abide in Christ, as we abide. I'm not just saying as we believe in him. Of course, that's where it begins. But abiding is finding our life in him. Abiding is spending time in prayer with him regularly. Abiding is spending time in his word and, and letting him speak to us, not just that we read the words. Many of us, I've said this many, often, many times, I know you've heard it, don't read for speed, read to feed. You know, we don't read to feed off of God's word often enough. We, we read to kind of get it done and check it off our list. But when we abide in him, we abide and we love, we grow and we live in him. You can't do it on your own. You can only do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to abide in the vine, the true vine, Jesus Christ. You see, to love one another is the fruit of the Spirit. And we looked at this on Sunday, but let me just kind of briefly say it again. There are many different aspects of fruit, many different types of fruit that we can see in Scripture. Uh, the, the, most, um, the most powerful fruit is love. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Um, really, one of the most obvious and important types of fruit that we bear is the fruit of lost souls coming to Jesus Christ. And we're to, we're to be involved in that. He wants us to be involved in that. Um, and so we read in Galatians chapter 5 that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Now, he said the fruit of the Spirit is. He didn't say the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kind. You know, we have a tendency to think there are nine different types of fruit. No, no. There's one type of fruit. It's love. And it expresses itself in at least those other ways, possibly more. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. How do you do it? 
you can't on your own, but you can if you abide in the Lord Jesus Christ regularly. If you do that, if you abide in him, then you can love one another because it's the fruit of the Spirit that works through your life as love. That's what, that's what he wants to do with us. Verse 13, greater love has no one, has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. You know, he says over in um, chapter, chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says there, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Actually, if you stay in the same chapter down in verse 15, he says, As the Father knows me, and I know my sheep, I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life. For the sheep. So here he is saying, This is what I do. In fact, shortly he's going to do this very thing for them. They don't fully understand it yet. They don't they haven't begun to draw close to understanding yet that Jesus is actually going to give up his life for them. But what an expression of his love, his sacrificial love for them, that he would willingly not just die, not just be tortured and die, tortured, die, and take the full strength of the wrath of God upon himself for my sins and for your sins. And so he says, there is no greater love than for one to lay down his life for his friends. And then he says, and you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Wow. Wow. This is, this is a really powerful, I hope you, you pick it up because I'm, I just keep saying it over and over again. This is a very powerful passage, but it is. Look at this. He says in, in verse 15, he says, no longer do I call you servants. Don't we call ourselves that all the time? You follow Jesus Christ, you love God, serve him. Well, of course we're to serve him, but we do it out of love. But look at this, because he says, I know you're my servants, but I don't call you my servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. I've called you my friends. For all things that I've heard from my father, I have made known to you. Wow. How can God call me his friend? I mean, imagine if, if I were to say, oh God, I know that you love me, Lord, I know that you are high and lifted up, you are almighty, you created all things from nothing, you spoke it all into being, you are alpha and omega, you are perfect. I really just want to be your friend. Like, I've got no basis for that. Unless he's the one who initiates it. Do you understand? Unless he's the one who initiates it. How is it that he can call me his friend? How, how can he look at you? Oh, more, more importantly, how can he look at me and say, John, you're my friend? How can he do that? Because I know what I'm really like. And you know what you're really like. So how can he do that? Because when you trusted Christ as your Savior... He paid the price for your sins. Remember, the, the word is you were justified. Just as if you'd never sinned before. That's what he's now called you. He calls you righteous. It's not your righteousness, not my righteousness. But the Bible says that he's imputed unto us. He's given us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when God looks at you, when he looks at me now in Christ... He sees us as justified, as sanctified, as, as, and frankly, even glorified. Though I don't see myself that way. I don't know how to see myself that way. Neither do you. One day we will. But God, who's outside of time, who sees us the way we will end up, can see us fully that way, justified, sanctified, glorified. You know, think of um, Abraham. Uh, of all the people in the Bible and 
God had some great relationships with m many different people, you know, Bible characters. But let's just think for a moment. Uh, Abraham, we read this in chapter 18. Here's Abraham, not in the best place, I might add. Abraham had, you know, been called by God. Uh, he's told when he's 75 years old that he's going to have a, a son. Now, his wife was, was barren, but God says to him, I'm going to give you a son. And years go on, and nothing happens. And then Sarah proposes, and Abraham goes along with the idea of, um, you know, we use the term helping God. And we kind of laugh at it, but, you know, we actually do it ourselves a lot. So Abraham and Sarah become God's little helpers. And Sarah proposes that Abraham take her handmaiden, the Egyptian woman, Hagar, and... Um, and she says, take my, take my maidservant and lay with her, and she'll give you a son. And so Abraham does that. And the son that comes from that union, his name is Ishmael. Now, this is not the son of the promise. So, so Ishmael was not an heir of the promises that God, uh, God had said would be to the son of the promise. Nevertheless, Abraham and Sarah did this. There was hardship in their home. No time to get into all the details about that right now. And here they are at one point, sitting in their tents in the heat of the day, um, actually out near a, uh, one of the oaks of Mamre. And here comes the Lord and two men. Now, Abraham sees them as three men, but it turns out it's the Lord and two angels. So they all look like men. Here's Jesus, actually is that that man that that Abraham sees the Lord in you know appearing as a man the the technical term or the theological term is a theophany or more specifically a christophany uh, and then two angels who appear as men and uh, Sarah prepares this huge meal and they provide it for the Lord and, and the two angels um, and then after they finished Abraham and the Lord and these two men take a walk and the Lord says, verse 18, he says, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? And he begins to describe to him the fact that the Lord is going to bring judgment down on Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities of the plain, what we would call by the Dead Sea area. Now, and the Lord fully knows, of course, that at this time, Abraham has family members down living in Sodom. And, and because he's considered a friend of God, we're told this in um, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Isaiah 41, and uh, another one will come to mind in a moment. Um, but uh, he, he tells them in uh, James chapter 2, we're told, the Lord, because of his relationship with Abraham, the Lord says what he's about to do. He says that he's going to uh, bring judgment down on these cities, knowing that Abraham has family there. And Abraham is interesting. He, he understands the relationship he has with the Lord such that he actually begins to now negotiate with the Lord and, and, and begins to ask questions. He said, would you actually destroy the righteous with the wicked? Would the God of all righteousness put the righteous under judgment? And he says, he, or he asks the Lord, he says, would you spare the city for the sake of 50 righteous? If there were 50 righteous found in that city, would you spare it? And God says, I would, I would spare it. And then Abraham, think about this. Because we, we learn a lot about the nature of the relationship that we also can have now with the Lord. Abraham asked the question. In other words, he figures, well, okay, if I can get away with asking, not get away, maybe that's not the way, best way to put it, but if I can ask that question, I'll ask another one. If you'll spare the city for the sake of 50 righteous, how about 45? God says, for 45, I would spare the city. How about 40? How about 30? How about 20? And he goes all the way down would you believe 10? And then he, he thinks, that's far enough. That's as far as I go. 
He's negotiating with the Lord. And then we would think that'd be crazy to do such a thing. But he's doing it on the basis of his relationship with God. Think of the relationship now that you have with God, that he would call you his friend, his friends. We have this friendship with the God of the universe. This God, same God. Right? We, we read in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever. So the nature of the one that Abraham spoke to is the same one you and I know as Savior. Everything we do, we do obviously out of love and obedience and respect. But we have the freedom to speak freely with him. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. But from henceforth, I call you my friends. For all things that I have heard from the Father, I have made known to you. Has he? You bet. I'm astounded at the number of Christians who don't want to spend time in God's prophetic word. And yet, God has promised through, his, through prophecy all the things that are about to happen. We know that we are at the end of the lip of the edge of the age, right at the cusp. And yet it's amazing how many people don't want to actually look in Scripture to understand things. You say, well, I don't understand a lot of the things I read in Scripture sometimes. Well, maybe, friends, that's because, and I realize there are things that can be hard to understand at times, but the closer we walk with Jesus, the deeper, you might say, that we abide in him. I propose to you, the more readily you will understand what has been written in his prophetic word. He's saying, I want you to understand the things that the Father has revealed. You didn't choose me, verse 16. You did not choose me, but, by comparison, right? You didn't choose me, but I, it's emphatic, I have chosen you. You didn't choose me, I chose you. You can't get away from the fact that this is very clearly speaking of election. And some people don't like that when we read this, when they think, well, this is all about Calvinism. And that's, no, it's not about Calvinism. Calvinism is a man-made idea, well-intentioned, I'm sure, in a lot of areas. But as you read through Scripture, it absolutely speaks of God's, um, God's plan of election for ordaining things about his foreknowledge. We read in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 that you and I are elect by God. We're chosen by God according to his foreknowledge. You know, when we read the word foreknowledge, sometimes we have a misunderstanding of the word. We think sometimes foreknowledge means that God looked down the corridors of time and he looked at you and he knew that one day you would place your faith in him. Well, okay, of course he did that. He knew that. That's not what foreknowledge is. He knew you. It's not what he knew about you. The idea of knowledge speaks of intimacy. Um, let's take it all the way. Adam knew his wife, and she brought forth their firstborn son, Cain. Right? Knowledge, intimacy. God's foreknowledge he knew you before the foundation of the earth. Now, you can wrestle with, how is that? Uh, we'll learn more as time and eternity roll on. But in any event, it says that you didn't choose me, I chose you. So let's understand God's the one who initiates here. I chose you and I ordained you, or you know, New King James says, appointed you. God ordained God ordained that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should last or remain. The idea is that you go and bear fruit. And the, the suggestion is that the fruit you'll bear, okay, it's going to be the fruit of love. It's going to be a lot of different aspects of fruit. But the primary fruit here is the fruit of lost souls coming to Jesus Christ. You didn't choose me, I chose you, God says, and I've ordained, I've ordained that you should go and bear fruit. You know, 
we read in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. Many of us are very familiar with this passage. We read here in, um, in chapter 2 of Ephesians in verse 8, that by grace you've been saved through faith. And this, this faith, is not of yourself. It's actually the gift of God. So that it's not of work, so that anyone could ever boast. And we tend to have that down, we know that. But then he says this, so important that we get it. For we are his workmanship. In other words, you're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. He's the one who initiated it. He's the one who made payment for your sins. And once you are saved, what, what is produced in us is what he produces in us. We are his workmanship. Now, the Greek word behind workmanship there is poema. Did you hear the word poem? You're his creation. Yes, we're a new creation in Christ. But, but what we do with our lives are things he's provided. Now, let's hear it. For we are his workmanship, his poema, created in Messiah Jesus for good works, which God foreordained. God prepared them in advance so that we should walk in them. Whoa. So the, the deeds that we are to, uh, to do, to perform as Christians were foreordained, God has prearranged them, that we will walk in them. You didn't choose me. I chose you, he says. And I have ordained that you should bear fruit. What kind? We just read about it, read about it in Ephesians 2.10. These are good works that God has designed in advance. We're not saved by works. We're saved to do good works. Once we're saved, that's when we do these good things. And you're not saved by those good works that you do, but you are rewarded for them later on in heaven. For more information, again, go back to uh, Sunday's sermon uh, on verses 1 through 8 in chapter 15. It's called Jesus the True Vine. Okay, so you didn't choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you, he says, or I ordained that you should go and bear fruit that will abide or that will remain. And that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. And this is the idea again, that these are souls. So think of those people in your life. Those souls that God places on your heart. I and mean, think clearly about this. When God places lost souls on your heart, I'll tell you, it's good instruction to take this to heart. When he places those lost souls on your heart, pray for them. Because if he's placing them on your heart, you can be assured he's going to see that they're saved. So pray for them. Be engaged in, in that salvific work in their lives. that They will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I command these things to you, verse 17, that you love one another. Um, these things I'm commanding that you love one another. Now we say all the time, and people say all the time, I love Jesus, oh, I love the Lord, I love the Lord, I love the Lord. And we, we throw this around to the point it really doesn't seem to have much value, if you don't mind my saying so. When in reality, he says, I command that you do these things. I command that you love one another. If the world hates you, and it does, is the idea, you could say, since the world hates you. If the world hates you, and it does, then know that it hated me before it ever hated you. Now, that may be a, a logical statement, but I'm going to put it a different way. That's one of those precious little promises um, that, that you won't find in uh, one of God's promise books. I say that maybe a little too snarky, but that's the truth, right? People hate Jesus Christ, and when they do, they also hate you. Why is that? Well, a couple different reasons. 
He says, and actually, let me, let me finish verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. You know that. People, you know, worldly people laugh at worldly humor. You have trouble laughing at those jokes because they're just, they're wrong or they're, they're, um, they're sick jokes, they're dirty jokes, or they're just immoral. You know it's wrong. The world doesn't care. It, 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 it hates him. And so it laughs at anything it has to do with righteousness. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, right? You defected. The, the devil hates you because you defected. Because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So you defected. And you have... Um, you have a glorious destiny. And especially when you talk to people about it, when you talk to lost people about that destiny, that you're going to be with the Lord forever one day. It grates on them in ways they may not even understand. They may, they may say there is no God. They may say there is no heaven. And they just get angry to the point where it's, um, it's an irrational anger. What's really at its root is that in the spirit, you've defected. You're born again. You're made of a different spirit. And the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit of God lusts against the flesh. There's no way that the two are ever, uh, that you, you can't work out a truce between them. There's no detente between those, those two ideas of the flesh and the spirit. He says, remember the word that I said to you, verse 20. Remember this word that a servant is not greater than his master. If they've persecuted me, they're also going to persecute you. And if, if you keep, if they kept my word, then they'll also keep your word as well. In other words, there will be people who are saved. But the reality is, the world hated the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why all of the world's hatred for righteousness came upon him 2,000 years ago. That same hatred will come upon you and me. You say, I don't like that. I have to tell you, it kind of doesn't matter. That's the way it is. But people are going to be saved. And you and I are called to be a part of this. That's what abiding has to do with this. He says, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they don't know him who sent me. They think they know God. I mean, you know, um, Muslims talk about God. People talk about God. People of all kinds of different religions talk about God. And they have their quote-unquote God. And these are not imaginations. They're real, they're real spiritual beings, but they're demons or fallen angels, however you want to look at it. There's only one true God. And we're the only ones who know him. He's only revealed through Jesus Christ. That's it. No other religion in the world could ever lead us to the truth except Jesus Christ. And so, he says, so if, if I had not come and spoken to them, then they would have no... It says no sin, or in other words, they'd have no awareness or sense of weight of their sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. They can't explain it away because it's already been revealed that one has come who is righteous. And that's why, therefore, why they hate. He who hates me also hates my father. You know, Jesus said back in um, John chapter 3, he said there that this is the common condemnation that light, he's the light, that light has come into the world and men loved darkness. Now, the word is agape. They agape darkness, this unconditional full out love. Men agape darkness more than the light because their deeds were evil. Now here he says, he who hates me also hates my father. 
if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, now think of, just think of all the miracles. Yes, the teachings, but think of the miracles. Think about if today if Jesus could come into Philadelphia or any big city and walk into Children's Hospital and just clear out an entire cancer ward, clear out the entire hospital just by a word that he speaks, his healing, would it get people's attention? You bet it would. And so here's Jesus saying that um, if I hadn't done these things, then they would have no awareness, no conviction of their sin. But now they have seen these things. They have seen me. They have heard my teachings. And also, nevertheless, they also hate both me and my father. But all this happened, he says, and we're only going to go to the end of chapter 15 here. But all this has happened so that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law, that they hate me without a cause. You can find this in uh, Psalm 35, Psalm 69. They hated me without a cause. Oh, they, they thought they had a cause. The scribes, the Pharisees, the corrupt high priests, the Sadducees, Oh, they all said they had a cause. They all said there was something they were after. But they had no cause. And they hated him anyhow. But when the Holy Spirit comes, or he says when the Helper comes, the Counselor, the Comforter, the one who is the Spirit of Christ himself, when the Holy Spirit comes, the one whom I will send to you from the Father. He's the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. When he comes, he will testify of me. Now, and I need to say, tell you that, that we'll get into this in chapter 16. But Jesus makes it very clear there in chapter 16 that, you know, people talk about the Holy Spirit a lot. They, they, they praise the Holy Spirit. Um, they, they, very often a lot of churches will have Holy Spirit worship services. Everything becomes focused on the Holy Spirit, not on Christ himself. And, and the leaders of those groups would say, oh, we would never do that. Well, but in effect, that is what they're doing. But Jesus is saying that when the Spirit comes, he won't receive glory from men. He refused that. Because the Spirit of God's only purpose is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, so when he comes, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. From here, we're going to start to move into chapter 16, and Jesus will talk about the persecution that's going to come upon them. And I think for many years, we've, we've allowed ourselves to say, you know, yeah, that, that's what happened. But, you know, we live in America and we don't think of persecution. We, we know that persecution happens in other places around the world. We know persecution happens in China and in India. And persecution happens in, in Russia and in a lot of different places around the world. Very true. We don't think persecution happens among us. And in many ways it doesn't. You know, sometimes we, we have such thin skin. If someone, if you're trying to share Jesus with someone and they call you a goo-goo head, they probably don't. But, you know, they, they say something kind of silly, like, oh, you're an idiot for believing that. That's not persecution. We think it's persecution. That, that's really not persecution. You're just called a goo-goo head. And in some cases, maybe you acted like one. But maybe you didn't. But my point is that that's not persecution. It's when they beat you up. They throw you down the stairs. They throw you off a wall or down off a cliff. When they hurt your family. They steal your job. I mean, and do all sorts of terrible things to you. Now we're talking persecution. And he's going to begin to develop this as we walk our way through chapter 16. And he'll talk again about the Spirit of God and the power of the Spirit of God. There's a lot we have to learn here. And so I don't want us to get involved in that tonight. But what I would say to you, we're called to be abiding and loving and growing and living 
in Jesus Christ. And as we abide in him, we will bear much fruit. That's our call. That's the call he's placed on your life. Let's do that. Let's walk together in Christ. Be the men and women he's called us to be.